that's a bingo. Is that the way you say it? That's a bingo. You just say bingo. Bingo! How fun! How fun indeed it is, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Short Story Bingo. Yeah, so much applause from my crowd, you know. My name is Nate Chacon III. If this is your first time, welcome. If it's not, the retention program is working. What I do on this podcast is I'm a glorified narrator to stories that you have heard and some that you've not. It's like Libro.fm, sort of. Thank you guys for coming back. And uh, yeah, we're super excited for what inadvertently became a three-part series. So um, on the on the starting syndicates of the mafia, uh, we started last week with uh, Lucky Luciano. Today we're going to be reading about Meyer Lansky, who we found out uh, that Lucky Luciano met when he was 10 years old. And then we're going to wrap up uh, next week with uh, the Five Points Gang and um, the wartime um affiliations that the mob had with the United States uh, in their assistance. Anyway, so, um, uh, yeah, I have a lot to, I want to announce, but before I do any of that, again, thank you guys for your support and listening. Um, let's get into what our, who has sponsored our podcast. So, uh, this episode is sponsored by Extraterrestrial Media. Visit extratmedia.com. If you need a film and music video, record an audio single, or get a drone shot of your business at home, need co- uh, consultation for a project, and much, much more, visit extratmedia.com. They have a range of services to help any of your media needs. We're also partnered with Libro.fm. When you make the switch from Audible, enter Story Bingo at checkout for your new membership. To receive two audiobook credits instead of one, Libro.fm makes it possible for you to buy audiobooks through your local bookstore, giving you the power to keep money within your local economy, create local jobs, and make a difference in your community. Here at Short Story Bingo, we have connected with the King's English Bookshop, which is, excuse me, which is located here in Salt Lake City, 1511 South, 1500 East. Visit kingsenglish.com. Um, Short Story Bingo is also partnered with Jaws or Size. Check that out, Jaws or Size. Uh, Brandon Harris and his team have created an innovative product that works over 40 muscles in your face. Just released a new line with mint flavoring. The Total Transformation Pack will ensure you see the results that you're looking for. Visit JawsOrSize.com and at checkout enter Story Bingo for, wait for it, 60% off your entire order. Wowzers, I'm so happy about that and you should be too. Yeah, that deserves a couple bombs. Perfect, 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 perfect. Oh shit, I'm my bad. I wanted to just hear how that sounded to the beat. Uh, cool, man. Well, yeah, episode 60. Wow, we're at 60 episodes right now, man. Um, in total, but 10. This is the 10th video episode, so we are very, very happy about that. I created a p- uh, playlist on the YouTube that shows like everything for Short Story Bingo and then the YouTube playlist for um, the video podcast. Uh, George, uh, Life, and I have been very, very blessed to have you guys uh, rolling with us, but... Yeah, man, we're, we're very excited. So make sure to follow, like, subscribe, rate, comment, all that, man. We use all the help we can get. Um, so, yeah, follow at George Life, at Extra T Media, at Gabino Grimes, at Short Story Bingo. Um, we appreciate any and all feedback, man. Um, with that said, let's get into our top three countries. That has just changed. The Netherlands, Canada, and the United Kingdom. And then the top three states sitting real nice at Florida, Idaho, and Texas. Uh, Today for the random Twitter follower shout out, it is at Elephant Grave. And Elephant East. Uh, Anyway, I'll put it here. Elephant Grave. Episode 60, Short Story Bingo. Peace. Short story bingo. Short story bingo. Short story bingo. Short story bingo. Sometimes they're funny and sometimes they're sad. Most of the time they're funny because I hate to be sad. Short story bingo. Short story bingo. Short story bingo. Short story bingo. But don't take my word for it. Spare fingers. Yes. All right. 
Word up. Meyer Lansky. Okay, one thing I'm immediately seeing is that he was born in 1902 um, and uh, just died in 1983. I, I don't know. Um, so he was, if Lucky Luciano was 10 when he met Meyer Lansky and he was born. Dog, was Meyer Lansky for real five years old when he was trying to get beat up by, well, when he put up a fight against Lucky Luciano at 10? That says a little bit about Lucky, you know? And more about Meyer Lansky and him being a fucking pit bull at five years old. I don't know. My math doesn't seem to be off too bad. So, 1867, 1902, that's five years. Anyway, all right. Let's read about Meyer Lansky. Again, we're reading out of the Mafia Encyclopedia, this awesome-ass book that I've had for so long. Uh, the second edition by Carl Safakis. I think that's how you say his last name. And if it's not, then fucking um, that's how it's being said right now. All right. It's a real floppy book. So, here we go. All right. God damn it. Ugh, okay. What? There was a godfather of the National Crime Syndicate, the parent organization of what became the American Mafia, and thus a real godfather of the American Mafia. He was called, with total respect, the little man. And Lucky Luciano's advice to his followers was always listen to him. He himself would brag with typical quiet elation, quiet elation. We're bigger than U.S. Steel. And an agent of the FBI would say of him with grudging admirations. He would have been chairman of the board of General Motors if he'd gone into legitimate business. Which is something to be said, too, because, like, these guys, and I was mentioning this on the last podcast, yo, business acumen is fucking top notch. You know what I'm saying? Like, as far as, like, how, like, they come up with their schemes to get money, imagine them being, like, the CEO of your business and how that would take that to a whole nother level. He was Meyer such a okay, I'm gonna do this. Such al such al Jansky. Such al Jansky. Meyer such al Jansky. Sukal. I'm gonna say is it Sukal? Sukal Jansky. Better known as Meyer Lansky. That's what we're gonna call him here. Okay? A Jew from Grodno, Poland. While many mafiosi speak of our thing, which includes which excludes all but Italians, it is a matter of record that none of the top mafiosi ever excluded Meyer Lansky from anything. Only among the lower rung levels of the mafia was there any belief that Lansky, because he was not Italian, was just a money man to be respected and trusted, one who lacked real power to vote in the top councils. Lansky truly had the first and last word in organized crime. When the Big Six dominated the syndicate in the 1940s and 50s, Lansky voted and all the others followed. Greasy Thumb Guzik, Guzik from Chicago thought Lansky the genius of the age. Tony Accardo marveled at the money Lansky brought in. Longies Wilman, head of the New, York, New Jersey Rackets, followed Lansky's lead at all times. Ditto Frank Costello, who was Lansky's partner in New Orleans, New Orleans, Las Vegas, and elsewhere. And Joey Adonis was under strict orders from the deported Lucky Luciano to listen to Meyer. The voting usually went six zip Lansky. That's also dog, that sounds like a dope ass like band name, Six Zip Lansky. Or like the Six Zip Lanskys, you know? I don't know what would that be like? It'd be like a mix between ska. And like, what whatever you'd classify like Rage Against the Machine. Six zip. What's Rage Against the Machine? What would you say, George? I don't even know, man. Rock. Rock, rock but hip, but like rock, like rock and hip hop. Yeah. The Six Zip Blanskys. That's a dope name, huh? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, everybody listen to Meyer. But the vote. Okay, so the voting usually went six zero Lansky. Six zip Lansky. Everybody listened to Meyer because it uh, because it paid. If they listened well, he might, for instance, give them a slice of the pre-Castro Cuban action. Lansky cut in Chicago, Detroit, New Jersey, New York. When the traficantes of Tampa tried to go in big on their own in Cuba, Lansky uses Batista connection to squash the move. That's big. Then he gave them a slice smaller than what many other mafiosi got. 
That was Lansky's way. Jack Dragna, the Los Angeles Mafia boss, once tried to use muscle on Lansky to get a piece in Las Vegas. Lansky talked to him in circles, got him up on tiptoes, and then not only didn't kiss him, but gave him nothing. It was Lansky's way. Despite a rash of publicity during the last decade of his life, Lansky remained the most shadowy of the organized crime looters. Although Luciano technically held the title, Lansky was regarded as equal and perhaps superior to Luciano as the godfather of organized crime as it emerged in the 1930s. Together, they were the successors of the old warring prohibition gangs, as well as the old line mafia, headed by the so-called Mustache Pete's, particularly Joe the Boss Masseria and Salvatore Maranzano. And the mafia as it exists today owes as much to the Jewish Lansky as to the Sicilian Luciano for its shape and prosperity. They were the perfect match. The well-read, even studious Lansky, who could survey all the angles of a given situation, and the less erudite Luciano. He could make out the New York Daily News or Daily Mirror, but he freely admitted the New York Times threw him. <laughs> who made up for his limitations with a brilliant flair for organization and the brutal character to set any plan in motion. Sorry, I didn't read that right after, because I, I was just put, thinking in my head. But let me, let me read you that. They were the perfect match. The well-read, even studious Lansky, who could survey all the angles of a given situation, and the less-than-erudite Luciano, who made up for his limitations with a brilliant flair for organization and the brutal character to set any plan in motion. Through the years, Lansky built an image of being uh, alien to violence, but it was a myth. In the 1920s, he and Bugsy Siegel organized the Bug and Meyer Gang, just so many nicknames, which some described as the most violent of the prohibition mobs in the East. They worked alternately, uh, alternately as liquor hijackers and protectors of booze shipments for bootleggers willing to meet their prices, which were so exorbitant that it amounted to extortion. Bug and Meyer muscle was also available for slammings and rub outs, pause for a fee, and was the forerunner of Murder, Inc. Didn't know that. The enforcement troop of the National Syndicate. Many Bug and Meyer graduates, dog Bug and Meyer, that's like a, that's like a, that's for sure a law firm. Come on down to Bug and Meyer, we'll either rub it out for you, or we'll make sure to do some slammings. Bug and Meyer, here's Lansky, here's Bugsy, we're Bug and Meyer. <laughs> Come to the Bug and Meyer College of Mafia Institution, Mafiosi, fucking insert something else here, where upon graduating, you can start your own rub out business, slammings, or whatever it is to get your booze shipments across state lines. Bug and Meyer. <laughs> oh, shit. Uh, that's so stupid. I don't know why you listen to this. Okay, may, many Bug and Meyer graduates, in fact, moved into Murder, Inc. in the 1930s. Murder, Inc. Lansky had as much to do with the forming of that outfit as anyone. He proposed the enforcers, he, um, he proposed the enforcers be put under the command of a triumvirate composed of Louis Lepke, Albert Anastasia, and Bugsy Siegel. Other leaders of the emerging national crime syndicate objected to the kill Happy Siegel, feeling he would be too loyal to Lansky and would give Lansky too powerful a hold on the apparatus of the extermination crew should the Confederation fall apart in a war of extermination. Lansky, Lansky agreed to drop Siegel, uh, Siegel from the murder troop, but his influence was not dented. It was said that no major assignment for Murder, Inc. ever went forward without Lansky being consulted, which is big. That was true even in the elimination of Siegel in 1947 for spending or stealing too much of the syndicate's money in his Las Vegas hotel operation. Yo, so they just killed Bugsy Siegel. They, first off, Meyer Lansky and Bugsy Siegel had their Bug and Meyer fucking institute going on, their Bug and Meyer gang. And then in 1947, 
goes ahead and just like, yeah, this is not going to work out. Also, Bugsy Siegel was taking a bunch of money, so they just took him out. That's as Bu- as Lansky says right here. I had no choice. Lansky was quoted as telling friends, but others insisted he had pushed hard for the vote to kill his close friend. Damn. What? Um. He did suggest the mob hold off execution for a time, though, while pressure was uh, exerted on Siegel to produce profits from his Las Vegas ventures. It was Lansky's way. So he's like, yo, just give him a second. He'll figure it out, you know, and then he didn't figure it out. Both Luciano and Lansky independently said that they had planned the formation of a new syndicate as early as 1920s. When Luciano was in his early 20s and Lansky was only 18, so Luciano's 23. Back in five year difference. Got that in my math, dude. They were greatly influenced in this by the older Arnold Rothstein. George, you were talking about him, right? Yeah. Yeah. And what what did what like off top what is Rothstein's connection? Um, he's just another. We're gonna one. read about it, but he's like just another one of the big Jewish names that w- that was in Vegas, right? Um, I believe so. Yeah, something. Okay. Well, he's coming up. Here we go. They were greatly influenced in this by the older Arnold Rothstein. The great gambler, gambler, criminal brain, and mentor who, acting on his own plan for a national syndicate, nurtured Lansky's and Luciano's development. Rothstein's murder in 1928, damn, shortened what the pair was may have um, considered too long an apprenticeship. Lansky and Luciano together survived the crime wars of the 1920s by cunning alliances, eliminating one foe after another, even though they lacked the manpower and firepower of other gangs. Effective dog. When they affected the assass when they affected the assassinations first of Masaria and then Maranzano, they stood at the pinnacle of power in the underworld. Even Al Capone realized they were more powerful than he. In remarks attributed to Luciano, he once explained, I learned a long time before that Maya Lansky understood the Italian brain almost better than I did. I used to tell Lansky that he may have had a Jewish mother, but someplace he must have been wet nursed by a Sicilian. Luciano often said, uh, often said Lansky could look around corners or anticipate what would happen next in the underworld intrigues and that the barrel of his gun was curved, meaning he knew how to keep himself out of the line of fire. Through the years, that was Lansky's way. There are a lot of Lansky ways, you know. Lansky never begrudged luciano in his top role realizing that the title brought the clear dangers of notoriety and no matter how many payoffs were made the hazard of being the target of the law it was also necessary to sell luciano as the top man in order to win the support of the italian mobsters lansky had fewer difficulties selling jewish mobsters like zwillman or mo dalitz dalitz or even the often unpredictable dutch schultz on the value of syndication. They understood the profits involved. The Italian mafiosi were different. Many cut adrift by the war of survival that had just been concluded. Lansky told Luciano, a lot of these guys need something to believe in. He urged Luciano to keep some of the old style mafia trappings used by the mustache peats. Luciano had no patience for the nonsense of made men and blood oaths, but agreed to let those who wanted such rituals have them. He did eliminate the position of boss of bosses, and immediately, as Lansky anticipated, gained that position de facto. At Lansky's suggestion, the organization took the name of Union Siciliano, a corruption and spelling of the old fraternal organization. Eventually, Luciano just called it the outfit or the combination. So they were just not good with, they, they just didn't want the whole, the boss of bosses shit. They're like, let's break this up um, so that we can focus on money. And George and, ta- George and I were talking off camera about how like their, what their biggest focus was just, uh, just like getting money. And I, I would imagine that like being in America, <laughs> capitalism started so fucking early here um, that, that, they were like, I don't, we don't give a shit about 
he said it says right here that he didn't give like Luciano didn't care about like the blood oaths. So I'm sure that they had like secret meetings and you know uh, shit like that, which I would never clown. So I'm uh, that's not me. I'm not clowning it or anything, but it's something that they didn't care for, so they just didn't do it. In time, though, Luciano saw the merits of the structure of the Italian wing. It gave him a, par- a power base and cemented that power. Even when imprisoned for a decade, his support never eroded, and he could issue orders and have his revenues set aside for him. As late as 1951, when his name surfaced during the investigation of bookmarking czar Frank Erickson, the New York Times, with one of the most reliable news libraries in the world, did not know exactly who Meyer Lansky was. This is 1951. This guy's been on the grind for fucking like 30 years up to this point, 35 years. The newspaper identified him as Meyer Socks Lansky, evidently mistaking him for Joish, uh, Joish, <laughs> Joseph Socks Lanza, the waterfront racketeer. During the Kefauver investigation in 1950 and 1951 into crime, Lansky was considered so unimportant that he was not even called as a witness to testify. The committee did not even mention him in its first two interim reports. Only in the in the final report did the investigators correct their oversight and announce evidence of the Costello Adonis Lansky operations was found in New York City, Saratoga, Bergen County, New Jersey, Bergen County, New Jersey, New Orleans, Miami, Las Vegas, the West Coast, and wait for it, Havana, Cuba. That's a long way to have your operations stretching, bro. What is the Kefauver investigation? H-I-J-K-L. Okay. So it'll be right before this. Let's see. Oh, wow. It's a whole fucking thing. That's something to look into. Kefauver, K E F A U V E R. They were, it was like some, it was uh, what I was just talking about the investigations into, um, I mean, the Senate, it was the Senate organized crime investigation. So uh, back in 1950 and 1951, for week after week, the Kefauver committee hearings were the hottest show on television. Many Americans did not then own TV sets, but accommodating retailers put sets in their windows and piped the sound outside so the crowds of pedestrians could view the media phenomenon. So this is a big deal. I mean, I'm sure uh, the most the most famous television scenes of the Kefauver hearings were shots of Frank Costello's hands. The underworld prime minister refused to allow his face to appear on camera. Fun fact about that and his insecurities preferred to be the dude from Home Improvement, Wilson. <laughs> uh, yeah, Google that or YouTube it. I'm sure there's some pretty cool best videos for that. Hmm. Okay, so let's go back to this. Uh, the newspaper identified him as, and I'm, the newspaper I'm referring to, again, the New York Times, um, identified him as Meyer Sox Lansky, evidently mistaking him for Joish Sox Lanza, the waterfront racketeer. During the Kefauver uh, investigation in 50 and 51 into crime, Lansky was considered so unimportant that he was not even called as a witness to testify. The committee did not even mention him in its first two interim reports, only in the final report. Then the investigators correct their oversight and announce evidence of the Costello Adonis Lansky operations was found in New York City, Saratoga, Bergen County, New Jersey, New Orleans, Miami, Las Vegas, the West Coast, and Havana, Cuba. All right. Back to it. Lansky was revealed as the brains of the combination. The little man, which is Lansky, the little man, became acknowledged as the one who held together Luciano's crime empire while he was behind bars. Lansky was the money man trusted to hide or invest millions for the syndicate, and he saw to it that Luciano got his share of the profits even after he was deported to Italy back in 46. It was Lansky who opened up what was for a time the syndicate's greatest source of income. Gambling in Havana. He alone handled negotiations with dictator Fulgencio Batista for a complete monopoly of gambling in Cuba. That's what's up. That's crazy. Lansky was said to have personally deposited $3 million into a Zurich 
Switzerland uh, to a in, excuse me three million dollars in a Zurich Switzerland bank for Batista, and arranged to pay the ruling military junta named Batista Junta sorry fifty percent of the profits thereafter. In the rise and fall of underworld fortunes, Lansky was immune to replacement because he was too valuable to lose. Thus, he could agree with Vito Genovese that Albert Anastasia should die, and then later he could take part in a fantastic conspiracy that delivered Genovese himself to the feds. Despite this publicity, Lansky faced no retribution. Lansky's arrest record over the years was Bush League stuff, and it was not until 1970 that the federal government made a concerted effort to get him on the income tax charges. See? Remember we were talking about that? Income tax, dude? Pay your taxes, dog. Or skim better. Lansky had skimmed untold millions out of Las Vegas casinos, which was the syndicate secretly owned. The government also sought to deport him as an undesirable alien. In 1970, Latsky fled to Israel, where so many of his Jewish underworld associates had retired. Latsky claimed Israeli citizenship under the law of return, which accorded citizenship to anyone born of a Jewish mother. That's what's up. Okay. Latsky poured millions of dollars into the country to win public support, but he proved an embarrassment to the uh, Israeli government. Damn. Law enforcement, an embarrassment. That word is so like, God, you're fucking an embarrassment. Oh, that's rough. Embarrassment. Okay. Um, law enforcement officials warned that Lansky was not retiring from organized crime, but would use Israel as a base of operations. I'm sure he was. After a long battle in the courts and bitter debate by the public, Lansky was forced to leave Israel in 1972. So he gets there in 70. Boom. Get the fuck out. Two years later. In 1973, after undergoing open heart surgery. 1973, not the best year to have open heart surgery. I'll tell you that right now. It's not a fact, but it's something that I would fucking find pretty uh, intense to have at in 1973. 2020, however, to have open heart surgery. That's a different thing. 1988, to get a breast augmentation. Probably not the best time. Wait 15 years. 2003, probably a better time to get breast augmentation. 2020, even better, you know? So, I don't know. Lansky was put on trial in Miami on the income tax charges that had worked so well. Um, okay, hold on. In 1973, after going undergoing open heart surgery, Lansky was put on trial in Miami on the income tax charges that had worked so well against many crime bigwigs since Al Capone. They were just catch, capping them all. They're like, if we can't get them on that, then we're just going to get them on fucking income tax. Dog. It was a disaster for the government. Lasky was acquitted. Damn, they didn't catch him. In December 1974, the federal oops, the federal government gave up its efforts uh, to put the then 72-year-old organized crime legend behind bars. Damn. Lasky maintained his position in the, syndi in the syndicate right to the very end. And in the early 1970s, his personal wealth was estimated at around $300 million. And by 1980, it must have grown to at least 400 million. Dude, what is 800 million? Let's see. Um, in 1980. Today. Okay, one, two, three. One, two, three. Oh my god. Okay, so 800 million in 1980 equates to 2.6 billion dollars today. Dude was a billionaire in 1980. Um, some profits, uh, yeah, some profilers rather have tried to explain Lancey's continuing to make money as an indication of his inner need for power and the ability to exercise it. They tend to overlook the more simple explanation. Lasky felt a man could never have too much. His drive was always for more. I like that. However, in 1991, a British writer, Robert Lacey, published Little Man, in which he insisted Lasky died hard up. So probably with, like no money. The theory gained few supporters. A New York Times reviewer found the book banal. 
Um, hold on. We're gonna. What does banal mean? And how do you pronounce it? Ban B A N A L. Banal. Banal. Really commonplace and often predictable. Used in common. Okay. Hack and I stale. Okay, so banal. All right, so they they didn't like the book. They said it was banal. Okay, a New York Times reviewer found the book banal, and dismissed uh, Lacey's claim that criminal investigators never pinned anything substantial on Latsky. But such evidence proves exactly the opposite point. Argue those who insist Meyer Lansky was a criminal mastermind who left behind a vast secret fortune. No one ever laid a finger on Lansky precisely because he left no fingerprints anywhere. The more you argue, there was no fortune. The more you prove, there has to have been, continued the article. Similarly, Lacey's theory would mean that Lansky, who had shown such men as Huey Long and Fulgencio Batista of Cuba, the joys of foreign numbered accounts, neglected to set anything up for himself. Out of the mil- out of the millions he admittedly accumulated, Lansky had created organized crime in its significant form, but he was never interested in creating any dynasty. His children and wife were kept totally away from mob business, and he looked for no successor. In that sense, Lansky was the quintessential Jewish American mobster. They either stayed until they died or else they sold out their positions in the rackets and went into retirement. Sounds like being in the mob is like a young man's game or some shit. As is life, you know? Shit. Meyer Lansky had outlived Lucky Luciano by 20 years, but in the end, Luciano's handiwork in the National Crime Syndicate, the American Mafia, was the portion that survived simply because it was a structure and apparatus that needed running that automatically filled all vacancies because it remained a money making machine. Yet Lansky in large measure created the American mafia and was its real godfather. Wow. And that ladies and gentlemen wraps up episode 60. Um, Wow, and that was on Meyer Lansky. Uh, certainly, again, appreciate everyone for uh, tuning in. Um, I, th- I think uh, there's a, a really interesting note here, for me at least, with how Meyer Lansky moved in comparison to, like, Lucky, Lucky Luciano. They put they described it there, but, like, the fact that Meyer Lansky was, like, the essentially the accountant and then Lucky Luciano was um, the motivator and got – you know, plan set in motion. Um, I think they, uh, I think they obviously made a lot of money and made a lot of moves and set the current modern American day mafia into uh, motion. And um, it all started with just, uh, you know, if, I mean, with lucky Luciano, as we mentioned in the last episode, I mean, he was what, 10 years old. Um, make him what he was doing the racketeering was like beating up people well he was protecting a bodyguard for fucking little kids and then as mentioned in that one that he came up on last he he had to be like six because i don't see a five-year-old even beating up a 10-year-old but i don't know with the description that meyer lansky was the little man all the time also very i disrespectful you know like for Meyer Lansky to go with it yeah I'll go with a little man that's fine um but yeah um I'm excited to read about the five points gang and the mafia's contributions to world war ii and that's what we'll do in the second or the third episode to wrap up the Meyer Lansky and look at Luciano connection um but again thank you guys so much for uh riding with us short story bingo episode 60 one more time to the countries the Netherlands Canada and UK what's up y'all uh, top three states, Florida, Idaho, and Texas. Yo, somebody from Florida, Idaho, or Texas, fucking email me, shortstorybingo at gmail.com. Or someone from the Netherlands, Canada, or UK, email me after you're listening to this, shortstorybingo at gmail.com. And let me know what's uh, your favorite episode. I'd love to to hear from you on that. Follow at Cabino Grimes, at George Life, at Extra T Media, at Libro FM, at Jawser Size. Um, and I'm missing anything. I think thinks I'm missing anything. Um, and yeah, certainly appreciate it. Boom. 
Uh, I hope you guys have a good uh, week end because this will be officially for sure dropping on Friday. And yeah, we're all caught up. So short story bingo, episode 60. I'm out. Dun, dun, dun. Spare fingers. Yes.